Well, we're continuing to think about how to plant and pastor healthy churches, safe or safer churches. And uh, this little series of videos is uh, and and podcasts is designed to accompany um, a, a PDF book uh, that I've put together uh, with that title, Planting Safer Churches, available from faithfruit.com from the publications page. And I'm encouraging potential planters uh, and church leadership teams uh, to work through each section to think about the implications for their church, about how their church can be healthier, more fruitful, safer, more loving, more grace-rich. Uh, today we're coming uh, to uh, the next in our themes through that little series and uh, the theme, the application today is this, particularly look out for narcissists and narcissistic behaviour. What is a narcissist? Well, the, the word comes from a, an, an ancient bit of mythology that there was this guy called Narcissus who was so in love with himself that he became obsessed with his own reflection. He, he caught a glance of his reflection in the water and was just amazed at how attractive this person was, that they came uh, uh, daily to gaze and reflect on the beauty of this person. The tragedy, if I remember the story correctly, is that eventually in this desperate bid to be united with his love, Narcissus plunges into the water and, and drowns. Uh, narcissism is uh, ultimately self-destructive behaviour. So a narcissist is somebody whose gaze is turned inward. They are self-obsessed. They think that the world revolves around themselves. They, they're literally in love with themselves. And so they see all of life through that perspective. Now, a couple of things to say here. The first is uh, that um, this does mean that there are people who display uh, these characteristics consistently, persistently, that they dominate their identity. Uh, and so... Um, narcissists uh, can be people with a, a particular, what, what some people call a personality disorder, and that may be due to mental health causes, or it may be due to sustained sinful practices over time. Uh, so we first of all need to be aware that there are people who will have this kind of personality disorder that this is just who they are, how they live their life, and they may be even completely oblivious. To how they are living and how it is affecting others and the danger that they're putting themselves in. But if at one end of the scale we have got people that we would say are narcissists and we would identify kind of personality disorder, at the other end of the scale, I think, is the recognition uh, the other end of the scale, uh, that narcissism and narcissistic traits are things that we can all be in danger of. That whilst you may not have a personality disorder, there can be times when we end up being like that. We show the characteristics, we show the traits. And this can apply to individuals, but also a church leadership team and a whole church community can become narcissistic. It can become inward looking. I, I remember talking to uh, a leadership uh, team uh, about how they'd responded to particular issues and I'd said that the way that they'd responded uh, was kind of narcissistic. 
remember someone taking that very personally. Are you calling me a narcissist? The response was, no, I'm not calling specific people narcissists. I'm saying that there were narcissistic traits in terms of how this team collectively responded to a situation, that its concern as a church leadership team was primarily on how they were being affected. So we can see narcissistic traits whenever there is that danger of us becoming turned in on ourselves, love turned in on itself. You know that this is um, how um, Augustine and, and later Luther uh, defined pride. That pride is when love curves in on itself, that we are meant to love others, but when it becomes all focused on me, and that's narcissism. Uh, Mike Ovey, when he was the principal at Oak Hill and when he was teaching on the doctrine of justification, uh, picked up on this issue of love turned in on itself. It was something that he felt was significant and important for the church to consider. Uh, and he argued uh, that because of that, it means that pity it can equally be a sign of pride. Self-pity can be as much about pride and even about uh, a form of narcissism. Because again, it is turning the attention onto me. So how are we to respond to that? And what are we meant to, to do? Well, I think it is helpful at this stage to be aware of how these traits come into our lives. Uh, so uh, what are the sort of traits that we see and, and, and how do they get in? And just looking at how that happens with people normally and with churches normally before we think about the, the extreme cases. And I want to suggest that we see some good examples of this in um, in the gospel. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, uh, we have got a whole series of encounters that Jesus had with people. Uh, and so um, it starts with him being challenged by the Pharisees about uh, what God's word, what the law says about divorce and remarriage. Jesus' response when they say that the law of Moses permits us to behave in a certain way. They think that the law is there to serve them. And Jesus says, no, the law is highlighting the hardness of your hearts. Uh, then um, you might want to open a Bible and have a look at these, these examples. Then you have, um, just as I'm doing, just to remind myself, um, you then have uh, parents bringing their children to be blessed by Jesus. And the disciples, uh, they turn them away. Don't bother Jesus with your children. Uh, Jesus is far too important, isn't he, in their mind to be bothering with them. Uh, later on, when Jesus is on the way into Jerusalem, he passes through Jericho and a, a blind man called Bartimaeus is crying out for Jesus to have mercy on him. And again, so they've not learnt the lesson yet. He's shooed away by the disciples. But I was preaching on this recently and I suggested that whilst the immediate presenting argument is Jesus is too important to give time to little children or blind beggars, uh, that the reality was that they believed that they were the ones that were too important, that they needed time with Jesus. And, and that, that is seen, uh, I think, when you, you look particularly at one of the encounters that happens. Uh, so in Mark 10 verse 25, sorry, 35, Mark 10 verse 35, uh, we read this, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. What a arrogant, what a 
bold claim. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, now, Jesus, uh, right at the end when Bartimaeus comes to him, will say, what do you want me to do for you? I meant to see that because Bartimaeus says, I, I want to see. I'm looking for you to heal me so that I can see you and I can follow you. Uh, their response is different. They answered him, allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. They wanted the places of honour. They wanted the, the top cabinet positions. They wanted to be Chancellor of the Exchequer and Foreign Secretary. As though anyone would want those kinds of jobs uh, in a modern government, although it seems anybody can take those kinds of jobs in modern government at times, doesn't it? They were concerned with their own position, their own status and their own importance. There's another incident in the chapter. Uh, there's a guy who's described in verse 17 as um, coming to see Jesus. Little headings that Bibles have inserted say that he was a rich young ruler. We're told that he had much wealth. And he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, and what you'll see if you look at that event, I'll let you read that in your own time, is, is this, that here is a man who looks at his life and on the one hand has a high level of self-confidence, self-righteousness, self-reliance, that he believes that he is self-sufficient in his ability to keep God's law and in his personal wealth. And yet here is a man who on the one hand has this huge level of self-reliance, self-confidence, and yet is in turmoil because he knows there's something missing. So he's saying to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you get that, that tension between I'm self-sufficient and there is something missing that leaves me uncertain? And often when you see the extremes of narcissism, you'll see this conflict of someone who has this high view of themselves and yet lacks a level of self-confidence, a level of contentment, a level of peace about their lives. So that they're always about protecting themselves. And they see any input from the outside as a, as a threat. So there are some examples of, of how we can start to become deluded about our own self-importance and how these traits can creep into any of our lives individually and, and into a church collectively. And I want to keep saying this, these are traits that we can all be at risk of. But in terms of safeguarding the church, we have to be alert that wolves and bullies will particularly present these characteristics. Uh, in other words, I think that you can have narcissistic traits without being a bully, without being a wolf. But you can't be a bully or a wolf, an abuser, without these traits. And these are likely to be magnified, amplified up in the narcissist. So the narcissist becomes somebody who is concerned with protecting themselves. They are so concerned about themselves uh, that they believe that they are the ones who have the answers to everything. And they begin to believe the lie that they are the only one 
that matters. Uh, the only one who has the gifts, the abilities, the character uh, within the church to make things happen, to do good, to lead. That they are the ones that are going to be right. And that means that they will often draw your attention to their success, their fruitfulness. They will want to be the ones that speak last to control decisions. They will be the ones that will try to draw needy, independent people into a dependent relationship with themselves. And that's where the opportunities for abuse rise. And the narcissist, because they see anything from outside as a threat, will put up walls to protect themselves. They will make themselves unapproachable when it comes to criticism. So approachable when it comes to people coming to give to them to meet their needs, approachable when it means people coming to be dependent on them. Uh, but if anybody comes and there's a feeling that this person's coming as my equal, definitely not as my superior, or, or if they're going to challenge me, then the walls will go up. That's where you'll start to see anger. That's where you'll see deflection. That's where you'll see dishonesty. And, and you, you will meet people who will just find it impossible to recognise the possibility that they might have been wrong, that they might have done something wrong, said something wrong, perceived something wrong. That's where you get gaslighting type behaviours as uh, they will counter any challenge to them with an accusation. But often when they have not even themselves been accused, they will go immediately on the defence and they will lash out because they will see attack as the best means of defence uh, to distract from where they are being challenged, where their heart is at risk of being exposed, where they feel discomfort. In... The section in the PDF where I talk about watching out for narcissistic bullies, I, I give a, a kind of a list, a watch list of things to be alert to. And so the first important thing I would encourage you to do as leaders is to reflect on your own individual lives And the culture of the church and the culture of the leadership team to see if any of those red lights, any of those warning signs are there. It is something that I would also have ready as a list for when uh, you are appointing people. Whether from outside to staff positions or from inside uh, to staff positions or to leadership roles or ministry roles. And, and when you are reviewing with people how they're getting on, are any of those warning signs present? So there's an element of watching and being on our guard. But also it's so important to know what the spiritual cure for this is. What is the biblical treatment and gospel treatment for narcissistic hearts. Here it is. Psalm 79. I'm reading from the um, Christian Standard Bible. Psalm 79. God the nations have invaded your inheritance, desecrated your holy temple and turned Jerusalem into ruins. They gave the corpses of your servants to the birds of the sky for food, the flesh of your faithful ones to the beasts of the earth. They poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem and there was no one to bury them. We have become an object of reproach to our neighbours, a source of mockery and 
ridicule to those around us. How long, Lord, will you be angry? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy keep burning like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that don't acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that don't call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Do not hold past iniquities against us. Let your compassion come to us quickly, for we have become very weak. God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Rescue us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Did you get that bit? That's the important bit. We're going to come back to that. God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Rescue us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations ask, where is their God? Before our eyes, let vengeance for the shed blood of your servants be known among the nations. Let the groans of the prisoners reach you according to your great power. Preserve those condemned to die. Pay back sevenfold to our neighbours the reproach they have hurled at you, Lord. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will thank you forever. We will declare your praise to generation after generation. Here in the psalm, Asaph, Asaph pleads with God to intervene. Uh, why? Uh, because the nations look on and mock as they see the desolation of Israel. Asaph's plea is that God's people will be able to look on and see the desolation of the enemy. So that as the enemy looked on and mocked God when they saw the desolation of Israel, so when God acts to vindicate, acts to deliver, acts in judgment, God's people will be able to look on and honour him and praise him. And so here's the point. Asaph's plea for God to act is not primarily for his own sake or for the sake of the people, not for his reputation, not for his comfort. Not because he believes that he deserves God's mercy. He knows he deserves justice. But he says, God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Rescue us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations ask, where is their God? narcissism is that our gaze is turned away looking in at ourselves from believing that the story is about me about us that we are at the center of the universe at the center of the solar system and getting that copernican revolution to happen spiritually so that our eyes are opened and like blind Bartimaeus, when we ask, Lord, open our eyes, we look up, our gaze is lifted. That's in the next psalm, by the way, that uh, restore us, God, make your face shine upon us so that we may be saved. Psalm 80, verse 3. Our gaze is turned outward and upward to God, to Jesus. What the narcissist need? The narcissist needs the gospel, needs to realise that it isn't about them, never was about them. It's about Jesus and his grace. It's about God and his glory. It's about his honour, his name, his praise. And whether that's because we are slipping into unhealthy character traits and patterns of behaviour and attitude, or uh, because we have been sucked into this trap of our whole personality being disordered by narcissism. 
it is. Our biggest need is Jesus. Our biggest need is to have that gaze turned outward so that love isn't turned in on itself. That we learn to love God again with our whole, our whole heart and to love our neighbour as or more than ourselves. Be on your guard. Let's show love even to the worst of narcissists because they need the gospel, they need Jesus. Uh, be aware of your limitations as a church and the constraints on whether you can appropriately witness to and and stir people if they have particular challenges and what outside help you might need with that. Uh, but our response, our response to these challenges it's got to be the gospel. Thanks for listening in.